Late night bag of blues with the white label. The pill pop and pop the cherry like a knife. You're tuned in to another episode of the Hustle Man Show. I got a really, really cool guest on here today. This guy goes by uh, the name Yosemite Sam, a.k.a. Ren Thomas, the <laughs> red beard gangster. Um, what up, man? What's going on, bro? Everything is everything, man. That, that, that intro was cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a dope intro? All right, cool, yeah. cool, cool, cool. You're, you're, you're the, uh, the second person to call me that. Yosemite <laughs> Sam? All right, good. That's myself. Good. Yo, li listen, I want to start off by saying uh, I'm, I'm a fan of your, your work before. So the way that I, I got to know you as a person, um, I got to know you on TV, actually. Right. So for those of you that don't know who Ren Thomas is, he's an aspiring artist. He is an artist. He's not an aspiring artist. He's an actual artist. This is what he does. He's been on battle raps before, like major, major platforms. Um, and he was on the show Signed, VH1, correct? Yes. Yeah, so that, that's kind of where I bumped into him. I seen you like on VH1 and it was like a talent search and I hear this guy get on and it's just like flames. Thank you. Like flames the some same color as his beard. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, who the fuck is this guy? Yeah, and then I, yeah, and then I hear he's from New Jersey. Yep. And I'm like, damn, Jersey's built like that. We, we, we're out here growing people, bro. Yeah. Jersey, no, Jersey's the biggest untapped resource for artists in the world bro. I, I, in my in my opinion you're not wrong bro you're not wrong there's a lot out here there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of people that you wouldn't know are from new jersey because you just wouldn't know you wouldn't know that ray Liotta's from new jersey unless you know you researched it or, yeah uh, joe pesci or you know um and then you look at hip-hop you look at red man the outsiders uh, artifacts lords of the underground you know all, all the guys that you know came before me and the guys that are still rocking to this day there's a ton a ton of talent here. absolutely absolutely so 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 for the people that don't know who you are you just give, give us a little bit more background on who, who Ren Thomas is how you get into this thing where you know you want to you want to take your your art you want to turn your art into a hustle this is the hustle man show after all I want I want people to really connect the dots right. on why you you know why somebody like yourself would even be on the show and what it is, you know, how you got to a point to the, to the point of where you're turning your music into your hustle. Right. Um, from the moment I started making music, it was a hustle. You know what I mean? From from selling tapes in the hallway to, you know, out of the trunk to eventually being able to turn it into, you know, being on television, doing Sway in the Morning, uh, winning various competitions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the hustle was always there, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I fell in love with music when I was a kid, you know? Um, my my earliest, fondest memories of my life are, you know, being driven to practice for baseball and, and making up my own words to Little Deuce Coop in the back of my dad's car, you know what I mean? Like, music, my family was very, very into music. No one was a musician, but there was always constantly music being played in my house constantly in the car and my parents had very different, like my mother and my father had two totally different um, uh, like genre types that they listened to. You know, my dad was more into like country, like, you know, the Johnny Cashes and the stuff like that. And then my mother was really into like R&B and doo-wop and the Beach Boys and, you know, it was a very neglected household. So uh, I listened to a lot of music growing up. And, you know, when I, I have an older brother who's about nine years older than me. And uh, when I'm a little kid, I got all this angst, right? And I, I, I want to, uh, you know, I'm like, I was a mischievous kid, you know what I mean? And uh, I stole a bunch of tapes out of his room. I remember my mom bought me this little cassette tape uh, deck, right? That I could listen to my tapes on. And I had like jock jams and, uh, uh, you know, new kids on the block and, and, and all this, you know. Is it, is it okay if I curse on here? Uh, go ahead, bro. Go right, ahead. So. I keep it 100% real here. Naturally for me to curse. So um, sure, sure. I have all these, uh, I have all these, ta these uh, you know, tapes that my parents approved of me to listen to. Sure. So my brother being older, he had his own tapes that he, he was buying. And um, I stole like, I don't know, probably 10 of them or whatever from him when he wasn't, wasn't home. And uh, it was the purple tape by Raekwon. It was, uh, um, shit. 
uh, yeah, only built for Cuban links, which is the purple tape from Raekwon. It was uh, Biggie's first album. It was All Eyes on Me by Tupac, Four Five Six Cool G Rap. Um, Classics. And uh, yeah, it was all like you know, this is like 1995 or six. So I'm about eight years old. So I start listening to this music, and it literally blew my mind. Yeah. Like never really heard rap music like that before, and it became my everything. I All I wanted to do was dissect these lyrics that these guys were saying and try to understand what was going on. And it was weird because I was, you know, this Irish kid in New Jersey and I started to relate to what Tupac was saying in California. And yeah. I started to relate to what Cool G Rap was saying in Queens. And, you know, it, it, I, I, even though we weren't having the same life experiences at that time, it was able to open up my eyes like, you know, back then there was no internet. So like you didn't know really what was happening in Detroit. Yeah. You didn't know what was happening in Florida. Yeah. All you knew was the paper, what your parents told you and what your teachers taught you. Right. So I'm able to expand my mind through this, this music and I'm already, you know, making up my own words to songs that my parents play. Right. I, I, I just, for some reason I gravitated towards that. Right. You know, instead of saying little dude's coop, I was saying something else. And, uh, you know, decided one day when I was about eight or nine years old, like, yo, I want to be a rapper. Like, this is, these are the guys that I, I, I'm in love with this music. I love what they're doing. I don't know if someone who looks like me does this. I have no idea. Yeah. You know, um, this is the I 90s. Think, this is early, bro. This is this before is, this Eminem. This is early. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, this is, um, I guess Eminem was doing his thing in Detroit at the time, but yeah. he wasn't a star. Nobody knew who he was. The, the, the funny thing is one of those first tapes that I stole was the Milk Crate by Milkbone, right? And he was like one of the original first white rappers. And, uh, you know, he, he, he's not even on the cover of the CD, so I had no idea. You know what I mean? Wow. So, like not, not knowing that, um, you know, this, this doesn't come from – I didn't know what the culture was yet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so – but I knew I wanted to be a part of it in any way, shape, or form. So my cousin – that lived down the street from me. I never told him that I was trying to rap and I was writing raps. He became a rapper out of nowhere, right? Huh. He lived four houses away from me and he was a little bit older. So um, him and his boys would record in the, their basement on, on these tape decks. And I was like, yo, I'm going to be your DJ. Yeah. Right. So I bought, uh, I got my parents to buy me these like new mark fake turntable things. And I was going to be the DJ for their group. And like two weeks later, they all quit rapping. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> you know, we were kids. So like, you know, one week you want to be Michael Jordan and next week you right. want to be Wayne Gretzky. So it's like, for the next thing. Yeah. yeah. So, but I wasn't. I was like, yo, can I use your recording equipment? Huh. And I would take because back in the day, they used to sell the singles with the B side being the instrumental. Yeah. So what I was doing was I was, I was dubbing those instrumentals and I was recording my own lyrics to songs that were out. Right. And as soon as I started doing that, I started pressing them up, right? In my, mom, in my mom's uh, den, pressing up these tapes or CDs or whatever it was at that time. I can't really remember. Um, and I just started, you know, selling them for $5 a piece. How, of how, how, how old were you? How old were you at that time? Where you start, where you start, wait, hold on. How old were you at the time where you start saying like, yo, this is like a marketable product, bro. I'm going to put this thing together. I'm going to stamp this thing and I'm going to go years, out. And I'm years, later, years later, years like, later. Give me an age, like 15 years old, 16 years old, 14. Uh, freshman year of high school. Yeah. All right. So, so uh, freshman year of high school, you start thinking that you have something that you can actually like, somebody's going to give you money for this. Right. My boys all told me, yo, that's, that's not bad. You know what yeah. I mean? They weren't telling yeah. me I'm good or nothing, but they were like, yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah. And uh, you know, I would, I still see people to this day and they'll be like, yo, let me get a mixtape. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, because yeah, that's yeah. what I say. Used to be like, yo, cop my mixtape, cop my mixtape. I was that guy in school. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was either shooting dice or I was trying to sell you my mixtape. That's all I was trying to do because, you know, from, from, from a young age, right? Like um, I grew up in a middle-class area from, from a family that had three kids and my father worked two jobs. So we didn't have no money. Yeah. So my friends on their 17th birthday, some of them were getting Escalades and Lexuses. You yeah. know what I, mean? I had to buy my own car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got off of like mixtape money. You know what I mean? Like yeah. selling, you know, putting out a project every, you know, rapping over a bunch of beats, making a mixtape and putting it out every two months and, and you know, starting so to gain some fans. And, so you ended up selling enough mixtapes to buy a car? 
I mean, part of it. And then, you know, some birthday money, shit like that. But you put together, you put together the scratch to do what you needed to do. Right. And and this was originally how you started off. Right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying like, I'm like master P and I bought a, a, a wraith. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, off a of mixtape money. Yeah, in the yeah, but bro, not you don't have to be. Yeah, That's I bought a nineteen. Thing. I bought a nineteen eighty uh, Volkswagen Jetta. Yes, <laughs> and if, if you did that through creating your passion and selling your tapes, that's a big deal. That's right. definitely a big deal. Right. So that hustler spirit was always in me. Yeah. And then from that point, I started. I was always a chubby kid, so. People used to crack jokes, but I was always faster with the comeback. You know what I mean? So that mixed in with the rhyming. And, uh, you know, back then, this is this is before Eight Mile. This is before any of that stuff. But we would go to parties and there would always be like another kid from another town that rapped as well. Yeah. I mean, and then that would be that's where I started battling. We used to battle for money. Yeah. And. I think I was a sophomore in high school and I started doing the college circuit, right? The New huh. Jersey college circuit had like, uh, they had battles at Rutgers with a cash prize. They had battles at Kane university with a cash prize, Monmouth university. And I went to all of them and I always won. So what, I was, what, what I, was it? What was the cash prize? Like you like won about like 500 bucks. Yeah. You was doing, like, you was, was doing it no ma- regardless. I but, was battling. But, I was, I was 15 battling dudes who were like 24. You know what I mean? Crazy. Like, they had no idea. Like, cause I always had a beard. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, and I was smoking cigarettes, drinking, hanging yeah, out. You yeah. Know, didn't even know that I was like this young kid that was, you know, coming there to battle. That's crazy. So you're 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 a 15 year old kid. You're doing this college circuit. Right. You're battling these guys. They're like 20 something years old. Right. You're winning these these prizes. Right. At what point in your mind are you thinking, yeah, you know what, bro, I could do this. Like, if I want to do this, I could do this. It's a, it's, it's a really funny story because um. My parents were always very supportive of what I was doing. Yeah. But I remember that first battle that I won at Monmouth University. I came home with $500. And my mom said to me, she, she was like blown away that I had won this. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, well, I was kind of hoping that you would go there and see that maybe this wasn't for you. Crazy. Right? Crazy. Even though that they wanted, they, like, you know, hip hop had this, this, this bad taste in people's mouth, you know, that, that hadn't experienced the culture, didn't understand it completely. You know what I mean? Like, um, she was just basically looking out for me. She was like, I don't know, like maybe, maybe you're good to your friends or in our town, but yeah. like, are you actually good? How are you going to make a future out of this joint? How are you going to make right. this future? Right. I'm, yeah. I'm coming up on becoming, you know, 18 or whatever in a couple of years from then. And, you know, she wants me to like figure out what I'm doing with my life. So uh, it's a two part answer. So she sees that and she's like, I guess this is what you should be doing. And from that point on, I knew it. That's crazy. Right? And then when I was a junior in high school, they brought me down to ask like, yo, what do you want to be when you get graduate? And at first I said, I want to go to full sale, right? Which was a music engineering school. And we looked into it and it was very, very expensive. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and be a rapper. And they actually, the, uh, my parents had to come in and have a conference with a psych, uh, psychiatrist and with the, uh, the principal, the vice principal, and a bunch of people from the school because they thought I was nuts. What? That's crazy, and, bro. And so, so the psychiatrist brought me to the side and, and, like, asked me all these questions. And she comes back in. She's like, he just likes making music. Like, that's what he wants to do. He's not crazy. Yeah. And ever since that point, like, I've always kind of, like, the chip on my shoulder is what always drove me to become better, right? Because oh. like, oh, you're gonna tell me I can't do it. I'm gonna do it better than you ever thought I could. You know what I mean? Oh. So it's like, that's always been the constant driving force of my entire career. So it started from those points. Like my mom not thinking I would win that battle. The the teacher saying you can't be a rapper. You know what I mean? So like, and a lot of people say that in lyrics. They'll yeah. be like, my teachers I wouldn't amount to nothing. Sure. Most of the time, teachers don't really say that. For sure. You know what I mean? Like, it's, sure. it's kind of like this hip hop thing, but it really, truly did happen to me. It does. It, it does. It does happen. But they're looking for it for a chip. They're looking for something to drive them. In your right. case, in, in your case, you got psychiatrists and shit in a room and they're right. trying to figure you out. It's, right. they, they're, they're like this kid from the burbs is trying to be a right. rapper in an industry that doesn't automatically 
you, you don't really fit into that industry at the time the way right. you would like a today, right? Right, right, right. This is, this is like, you know, probably a couple years after Eminem becomes, you know, what he became. Sure. And, sure. you know, like, so like, there's like one dude. So it's like, you know, there's, there's one guy that looks like me that's doing it and everybody else doesn't. So they're like, you can't do that. It's one in a billion. Sure. And it's like, okay, well, you know, did there you is know that who, one person. <laughs> did you know who M was at the time? Uh, by the time, yeah, he came out. I was like uh, a freshman in high school. I think he came out. So, so, yeah, so the funny thing is my name was Renegade originally. Yeah. And, and I used that moniker all the way up until 2013. And that was always my name. And then him and Jay-Z put that song out. And people used yeah. to be like, oh, you name yourself that M song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, I didn't. Yeah. It had nothing to do with that. It was, just, it was actually a wrestler named Renegade from WCW. That's who I named myself after. <laughs> That's dope. So you're, you're, you're going through this process, right? How important is it for you throughout this process of trying to, like you're trying to convince everybody around you at this point, this is something that you're going to do. How important right. is it for you to like follow through on the things that you say in order to show them and give them every reason not to doubt you at that point? Uh, probably priority one. Priority one. And how did you do, how did you do that? How did you, every, how, did, every, how did you instill that yeah. every day? Every day. I huh. never stopped rapping. Uh, the only times that I wasn't in my basement creating music is when I was at parties battling on the weekends. That's crazy. If there wasn't somebody to battle, I was just kicking rhymes about what was happening at the party. That's crazy. Yeah. So you're, you're, going, you're going every weekend, you're honing your craft, you're getting better every week because people, people don't understand that, that that's how that works, mm -hmm. right? You're crafting, you're, you're, you're engineering it. You're, right. you're little by little, you're getting better every week, better yeah. every week. That's right? why when people, people say you're so, um, uh, what's that word, the word that they use, you're gifted. Yeah. I'm like, nah, not really. I was probably just like anybody else, but I yeah. just did it every day. I mean, I don't think LeBron, like LeBron James is physically gifted, yeah. but it, it, I'm sure his jumper wasn't that good. It was that he worked on it every single day. He didn't come out of the womb shooting threes. You know what I sure. mean? You got to have the work ethic and put it in. It's right. nine. It's like 90% work ethic, bro. It's 10% whatever you have. And then 90, because there's a lot of people that are quote unquote gifted. There's a lot of people that can right. do things, but Right. And the 90 percent difference is like the guy that's willing to go like the extra mile, the hundred extra right. mile, whatever it is. Always. So you're 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 at a point where you've you've kind of decided this is what you're going to do. You're rapping. You're doing this thing on the weekends where you're battle rapping people and you really you're, you're cutting your chisel away at the diamond. You're trying to perfect right. your craft. Right. What what's next for you? You know, because you got to convince now. I think you've mentally convinced yourself. There's maybe some doubt still. Who knows at that point sure. in your life? But you're convincing everybody around you. How do you, what is your thought process? And how do you go from like that to signed? Uh, so I graduated high school. Um, and I'm, I, I, when, I when I graduated high school, I wasn't making no money making music. You know what I mean? Right. I, didn't know how to get a deal. I didn't know how to get beats. Like the internet was still pretty new. So it wasn't like you could just go on Instagram and make a post and people would know who you were. It was like, sure. you had to actually like be out there going to shows and stuff like that. And uh, I met another artist who made beats at the time and me and him formed a group. And off of the first 10 songs that we recorded, we got a record deal. That's crazy. When I was, when I was, I was 18 or 19. I can't remember. Um, so we signed a deal, we created an album and then we got shelved. Hmm. So this is, so while we got shelved, uh, we were, we got put on a different mixtape, right? So you know what shelved is, right? So yeah, like, yeah, yeah. basically we recorded the album and the label was like, okay, we're going to try to sell it to another label. Yeah. And then because we signed a shit deal yeah. and basically like, you know, we were kids, we were, we were, we were overzealous. We, we, we saw money and we ran for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. So you record, um, you signed, you signed a deal with this label and yeah. their, their idea or their thought process, they was going to, they were going to resell it. But if they yeah. don't resell it to the right label, they're not right. going to promote your album. They're not gonna put the marketing dollars behind it. And then yeah. your album is literally sit, sitting in limbo. You can't create right. more because you got a record no. deal. So you can't even exactly. work. You can't monetize your craft at all unless the label wants to put the money behind it. 
Yeah, so we were locked in this deal for two years. So during that two year span, we put out a, uh, they allowed us to put a song on a mixtape for this DJ. And the DJ, it, it ended up being the single for that mixtape. And they asked us to do this radio show. And I went to this radio show in Union City, New Jersey. Shout out to Real Deal Radio. I don't think that they exist anymore, but the guys who shot for Grind Time, which was the world's largest battle league at that time, the guys who actually shot the footage for the battles sure. were the guys who ran that radio show. And when I went up there and I rapped on the radio, they were like, yo, you ever think about battling? And I'm like, yo, I battle all the time. Like, and they were like, yo, you should do it professionally. Hmm. I was like, yeah, whatever. I, I don't got time for that. I'm trying to like actually do music. I'm signed. You know what I mean? Like it was hmm. like this whole thing. And uh, a few months later they called me and they said, there's this league called when animals attack in New Jersey. And the dude who's in the main event battle just got arrested. Hmm. So we need somebody to stand in. Hmm. It's tomorrow. Are you down to do it? And I went there and I ended up becoming the champion of that league. That's crazy. And that night, Poison Pen and Pumpkinhead were both there. Rest in peace to my brother Pumpkinhead. And they were both there and they were running Grind Time's East Coast division at the time. And they were like, yo, you got to come to Grind Time. So I went to Grind Time for two years and was 19 and 0 over those, those two years. 19 and 0. 19 and 0. Under, under the name Renegade. Wow. Yeah. So from that point, uh, in 2013, I won EO Dub, which is the world, um, basically like the biggest freestyle competition in the world. Yeah. So I became the U.S. representative for that year. I went to London and I placed third in the world. Uh, I came back from that and continued making music for the next like five years on like pretty much a local level and kind of like one foot in, one foot out. Didn't want to battle rap anymore because grind time had fallen apart. Um, and and I, I was like in this weird, weird spot for a few years. And then um, I did a record with this dude named Screwtape from Philadelphia. Well, he's actually from Jersey. He's from uh, Blackwood, New Jersey. But he was always out in Philly. And he invited me out to come do this show with him. And while I was out there, everybody was like, yo, the song that you guys did on this guy's album is our favorite joint off of it. Mm. You guys should work together. So we ended up getting signed to Sensi Star as a duo. Mm. And after I got cool with the guys at the label, they were like, let's put out your solo album. Mm. During that time, uh, while I was putting out my album, I've been nice with Sensi Star. Um, that's when I got asked to come on Sway. That's when uh, Team Backpack happened. And um, so Team Backpack they had this competition that was 10,000 rappers and I ended up winning it, right? Out of, out of 10,000 rappers? 10,000, yeah. So- Bro, hold, hold on a second. You just kind of just breeze and bry shit. You got to slow it down. You, I'm sorry. You, you're, you're, you're a battle rapper. For, th for those of you that are watching this show or those of you that are listening to the show, a battle, like I've watched this on YouTube. I've watched some of your battle raps on YouTube, okay. right? You're, you're, you're literally battling another person. Mm -hmm. on a mic in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people, correct? In order for you to like, for you to go on that stage, the level of craft that you need to have, it's crazy, bro. Like it's really, yeah, I mean, it's really you can't, dope. You can't mess up at all. Nah, you can't mess up at all. And you, and people is watching you, man. You're again, you're a minority in the, in the, in the music business, right? right. So you, you got to prove yourself double, triple as much as the next person. Yeah. Yeah, so you're you're up there. You got to be up there, up there. So right. you you go to these rap battles, like you went out of ten thousand people. How does that how does that work? Ten thousand uh, people are battling over the course of how long? No, no, no. So this was um, this is a thing called Team Backpack. Uh huh. So it, it's not a battle. It's who raps the best. Uh huh. Not actually battling somebody. Uh huh. So uh, with Team Backpack. They had 10,000 people submit. 600 people got picked to actually go to I Brooklyn. You. I got you. 600 people rapped the first day. And then the next day they brought back the top 16. And then we fought it out for who the winner would be. I got you. I got you. So when I won that, there was a guy in the crowd who worked for Viacom as a, a casting person. Yeah. He submitted my tape to signed. Crazy. 
And then they called me and they were like, hey, this is, yeah, I, I swear to God, when they sent me the email, I was like, this is fake. Yeah. Because it was originally supposed to be an MTV show. Yeah. Um, and then Vi Viacom owns MTV. Yeah. Right. And they, and they own VH1. So it was whoever wanted to bid it out or whatever, sure. however that works. So, so, um, so, so for those of you guys that don't know, what was signed? What was the, this? Somebody, somebody at the show, you win from Team Backpack, 10,000 people submit. It, it, you get whittled down. You end up being the winner. Right. Somebody takes footage of that, sends it over to somebody that's trying to start a show called Signed. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about Signed and what Signed was and how that experience worked out. So the way that I was introduced to it was they were like, yo, it's going to be like the real world, but for rappers. Huh. So that was my original, my original thoughts were, okay. And then they were like, we need you to come to Atlanta for two months. Huh. And I was like, OK, so, you know, I looked over the contract and everything. And originally they wanted 10 percent of your gross for the next 10 years. Wow. Which is kind of which is kind of standard with those yeah. kind of television shows. I know like I know people who have been on um, the, the three or the five, four or some, whatever that show is. And then America's got talent. I, one of my friend's brothers was on that and it, it's a standard contract. What ended up happening was they sent us a revised version of this contract. And it said that they weren't going to take anything. Wow. So I said, all right, cool. I'll do it. How did, so, it, what, what changed their mind? Why did they go from 10% to nothing? I, I, I'll tell you why. So yeah. basically uh, the judges on the show ended up being Rick Ross, Lenny Santiago and the dream. Yeah, those guys didn't want Viacom taking any money from any artists that they were going to have dealings with. Hmm. Moves. So in order to get those celebrity judges, they had to revise the contract. Now, we as the people being on the show had no idea who the judges were. Right. So they I fly out to Atlanta uh, the first day. They kind of broke down like what we were going to do. We had to do all these tests and, and, and all this other stuff like a health exam and all kinds of stuff. But it's all it's all pretty, pretty basic stuff when you're on a, a reality TV show. So like, uh, you had to meet with a, a therapist and, you know, they had to make sure you weren't like insane or some sure, shit like that. Wrong with you. Right. Right. So uh, the next day they were like, OK, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to this studio. So, which was Patchwork Studios, which is where like uh, Tupac used to record there, and it it was it was really crazy. Like, so we get to this place, and then they have you walk in the room, and that's the first time we see who the judges are. That's crazy. And then so they were see, like, "All right, rap." So you you see the judges, and who's standing in front of you? Yeah. Who's standing? Well, like, I I I never I didn't know who Lenny was. Yeah. Uh, like I did, but I didn't know what he looked like. So 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 I knew he was Jay Z's right hand. Okay, so yeah, explain that a little bit more. So Lenny is who? Who who is Lenny exactly? And he's in the room as soon as you so, walk in. I don't know what his title exactly is, but he's yeah. like he like runs Rock Nation pretty much. Yeah, I gotcha. So I don't know who that guy is. And Rock, then the Rock dream Na Rock Nation, aka Jay Z's label, right? Jay Z's right hand man. So you yeah. you didn't know who that was right in no. front right in front of you? Did you know who else was in the room? Well, so the dream was there, but I didn't know who he was either. Like I knew I, I'm a fan of dream. Yeah. But he looked different. He had his hat real low and yeah, all yeah. the jewelry. And I, he, I, I didn't know who he was, but in the middle was Rick Ross. And I was yeah. like, all right, I know who that is. You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Um, they end up, I end up going through my first song and then they're like, all right, we like it. Do another. So I do this other one and uh, halfway through I stumbled. Yeah. And I was like, yo, let me run that back. And they were like, nah, you're cut. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is like the behind the scenes real story. So, yeah. so Ross goes, so I'm standing there like, damn, I came all the way out here and I messed up and all right, whatever. Yeah. So then Rick Ross, he comes over to Mike to me because I'm in a booth. I'm in a vocal booth. Yeah. And he's sitting at, he's sitting at the table and he goes, yo, it says on your, uh, says on here that you're an undefeated battle rapper. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I don't believe you. So I was like, all right, let's battle. Yeah. But then he was like, all right, come in the room. So I come in the room. I think I'm about to battle Rick Ross. So yeah. <laughs> they they bring down another contestant off the show. And yeah. I battle him. And then 
I guess it like sparked their interest a lot because they were like, yo, it ended up being the longest segment on the show was that battle between me and Nilly. Yeah. And shout outs to Nilly because that's my guy. I, I actually just did his podcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, great dude. Uh, so I end up doing that. And basically the television show was, it was a talent competition. It was like, the first, the first week we were, there was like, I don't know, uh, 50 artists in total. Yeah. And then after the first day, there was like 15. Yeah. They like got rid of everybody. They got rid of a bunch of people. And then we had to do like uh, a different uh, like tasks or whatever. Sure, sure. Right? We, we would go to the studio, record a record. They would listen to it, tell us what they thought. And then, um, Halfway through the show, I get they started using me as like a weapon. Hmm. So they knew that like nobody else on the show really could battle. So anytime Ross or Dream or Lenny didn't like one of the artists, they would make them battle me for their spot on the show. And every time they would lose. <laughs> so what ended up happening was um so Lenny, I got picked to be on Lenny's team, which so I was on a Rock Nation team. Ross was like set on these other three artists the whole time. So me and Ross had some like conversations, you know, about working with him or whatever. And then I never really spoke to Dream at all mm -hmm. uh, because he was he was focused on an R&B artist that were on the show. So uh, Lenny took me to to Cali with him. So we flew out to Cali. I met DJ Khaled. I rapped for him. He was like, he's the one. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yo, you're fire. I should put you with Timberland. Yeah. So then Lenny took me to uh, meet DJ Mustard which never got put on the show. That's crazy. I have, a, I have a record out that's like, Lenny S said DJ Mustard had a beat for me. Yeah. Rick Ross scored at the game, needed me. After the show, nobody reached out. And that shit is eating me. Not even to keep doing your thing, Rand. Where's the decency? You know, like, so I, I rapped for DJ Mustard. He was like, he's the one that I pick out of the other guys that rap, rapped for him or whatever. Then they brought me to DJ Drama in Atlanta, and I spit my verse for them, for him over uh, on his radio show and he made me rap it for him two more times outside just to hear it again. Wow. Right. So all these guys are like, yo, you're so during the show, while I'm on the show, all the other artists are like, yo, Ren, don't even worry about shit. Like you're, you're getting signed. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know, man. And when the, um, so the last, the last week of the show, while we're out there shooting it, they narrowed it down to like eight artists, I think. Yeah. And, uh, we had a dress rehearsal. So we have this dress rehearsal for the finale, the final performance. And they packed the club. And I get there for the dress rehearsal. And I go on stage and I'm rhyming. And they cut my music off. Hmm. So I, I look up and I'm like, yo, what the fuck? Yeah. So... After after I get off stage from that, I go up to DJ Snake, I think his name is. He's Rick Ross's uh, DJ, his road DJ. So I'm like, yo, like, what the fuck? He's like, oh, my laptop got unplugged, which wouldn't turn off your computer, but whatever. Mm. So I'm like, all right, just make sure it doesn't happen during the actual performance. Mm. So me and the girl Bria were the only two people who had a flawless finale performance. Mm. So the next day we go to the Dreams Mansion out in Atlanta and Dreams like, yo, I'm not, I'm going to pass on you. I'm like, all right. So then Ross is like, yo, I don't know how to market you. I'm like, all right. And then Lenny was like, I thought Lenny was going to sign me. And he mm. was like, yo, I'm, I just don't think you have a hit record. Mm. And I was like, okay. So that was it. So then I came home and I had to be real hush hush about the show and shit. Why would so, why why'd you have to be hush hush about the show? Because I had a, a NDA, a non disclosure agreement in my contract. Yeah. So until the show aired, I couldn't speak on what had happened on the show. Sure. So uh, the show airs, and I'm like, "Yo, how are they gonna make it look like I wasn't, you know, as good as I was?" Mm -hmm. I made sure that the whole time I didn't say anything wrong. You know what I mean? Like I know that they could edit it in a certain way, though. Mm. So. During the, the, the actual show on VH1.com, I was 10,000 votes ahead of the person in second place of who the audience thought should win. That's crazy. Yeah. So the last, the final show on hold the on, finale. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. They're, they're, having, they're having a live voting 
Well, the show as the show is airing. I don't I don't remember seeing the live voting part of it. I remember it's watch, be I remember watching the show is fire, by the way. It's a dope show. I'm waiting for I haven't seen season two. I know you're not a fan of the show right now after the situation. No, 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 no. I'm let, yo, I, me, I told them I told because they reached out to me when they were doing season two. Yeah. Where is season two? What's happening? I don't think they did it. Yeah. But they reached out to me and they were like, We want you to come back. And I guess they were gonna have me come back and battle some people. Bro, or bro, one hundred percent. If you get back on the show, light light it up. I feel like I, I feel like sometimes in life we, we don't have like there's a trajectory. And I was talking to you about this on the phone before we got on the podcast. God right. works in mysterious ways. For sure. I, I think you're the best artist on that show. Thank I, you. I'm not Rick Ross. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, my opinion doesn't count for much. But, but the reason why I'm speaking to you is because I think you're the best artist on that show. I saw when I watched the show, I said, this guy, whoever this guy is, I got to reach out to him because his, he just he, he does it. Yeah. He does it. And I seen Khaled's, and I seen Khaled's reaction. Yeah. When, you, when, you, when, when you was rapping for him, I seen his reaction. Right. You know, it was automatic. He was like, I got to hook up with this. Right. So, okay, so you come back home. I cut you off there. You come back home. You have an NDA. Yeah. You, you don't, you're kind of in a state of limbo, correct? Right. Yeah. So, well, no, so the, the week that the, the, the show aired, I dropped my album. Huh. It was, I was very strategic with huh. it. And it it actually, uh, we did like 600,000 streams on my album. Wow, that's crazy. And the single was produced by Pete Rock. And that was one of the things I said to Ross. He was like, yo, so keep doing shit. And I was like, word, I'm actually uh, going to go home and drop this record I got with Pete Rock. And he was like, you got a record with Pete Rock? I don't even have a record with Pete Rock. He ended <laughs> up doing a record with Pete Rock since then. Yeah. But uh, I was like, yeah. And he was like, why are you on this show if you're working with people like that? And I was like, yeah. promote it, man. Yeah, 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 for <laughs> so, sure. So I dropped the album, whatever. And then uh, during, we watched the show, the voting's happening weekly. I keep checking on it. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I just keep wondering because I know that I didn't win. So I'm like, yo, how are they going to, like, the, the whole country, everybody that's watching this show obviously thinks I should be the winner. That's crazy. How, how are they going to make it so? How that are they going to edit this to make it look like I didn't win? Yeah. So there was, there was two things that were weird that happened. So the day that I rapped for drama and drama kept saying that verse was crazy and wanted to hear it again. When Lenny comes back to, um, when Lenny comes back to the uh, studio, I go inside and there's a shot in one of the episodes where the three of them are standing outside talking. Yeah. And Lenny goes, yo, Ren spit the illest verse I've ever heard. Wow. And dream says it doesn't matter. He's white. Wow. Yeah. And I remember watching that on television and being like, wow, I wish he was standing in front of me. Wow. That's crazy, bro. And because, you know, he always treated me with respect on the show, but to know that he said that behind my back, he'll always be a sucker for that. That's crazy, bro. Right. Um, so anyway, so the finale, they, they dropped the finale episode. And during the finale episode, I come out on stage and they used my footage from my dress rehearsal where the DJ cut the music off. That's how they used it. I got it. I'm standing there on stage like this. Yeah. And then they cut in. You know how I said in the first episode when I first rapped, I stopped and asked if I could rock again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ross said to me, you shouldn't have stopped. They edited that in of him saying that. Yeah. At that they point, it. they're giving me my, uh, you know, whether I'm getting signed or not part. Yeah. So it was used against me. It. I cannot say anything bad about the show. Yeah. You know, it, it is what it is. Um, yeah. It was a great catapult for the rest of my career. Yeah. I was already touring before that. You know what I mean? I was signed to Sensi Star with Screwtape and we had went on our first tour and that was the main thing. Like, I wanted to be a touring act. Yeah. Being a SoundCloud rapper, I guess, is cool. Like, you make music, put it out, and people listen to it. That's fine. I want to touch stages. Yeah. I want to travel the country. I want to see this whole shit. I want to see yeah. everything. Yeah, but the, you have a defined goal. That's what you want to do. That's, right. that's Yeah. So, uh, that first tour that I went on, I, after each show, I would find out who either the artist was that was like the guy in that city 
who was at the show, or I would find the promoter or the owner of each club. And I would make sure that I got their contact, make sure that I chopped it up with them. Everybody else I was on a tour with, shout out to everybody else that was on a tour with me because they're yeah. my friends and I love them. But they weren't doing the same thing. They didn't understand the business side of it. They were, they were chasing chicks and getting drunk. Right. You know what I mean, I was like, yo, we could do that after. Yeah. Let's, let's stick to business right now. And I made sure that when it came time, when the TV show came out, damn. My neighbor's cutting the lawn. Is that going to bother you? All good. I'm fine with it, bro. The convo is good, regardless of what the background music is. Um, so when, uh, when I had the chance to, you know, use the, the television show, the Team Backpack Victory, and around that same time I did Sway in the Morning and got picked top 10 of that year that went on his show. Yeah. So I used all those things and all those contacts from that first tour to set up my own 30 city tour where I headlined in 30 different states. That's crazy. 30 different, I'm sorry, 30 different cities, 20 right. something different states. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing is it's like, it's gotta be a hustle. There has to be merchandise. Like there's no money in music anymore. Sure. Right. Like it's teenage mutant ninja turtles. What do you it's mean? Saturday, it's Saturday, it's Saturday morning cartoons, bro. The music right. in the music industry came from a place, and this is just my understanding of it, where you could package a product and sell it for $15, $20, right. aka a yeah. CD or a record yeah. or a cassette. And then it turned into this thing where, you, you know, people were getting your music for free. So, right. so, so the business became give it away, right. Saturday morning cartoons, right. give the content away, and sell the, the action figures, sell right. the shirts, sell the hats, sell the merch, right. sell the touring, that's right. It. That's what it is. All of the money came comes from hitting the road and having a merch table. Absolutely. You know Absolutely. I mean? But you understand you understand the business aspect of what it is to be an artist. Right. Which wasn't like something that anybody told me. It was what I saw. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I was with an established artist named Adlib and I saw how much money he made off of the shows and how much yeah. he made off of merch. And when I picked his brain about how much he made off of record sales, it was it, Nothing. It, it wasn't even comparable to what yeah. he was making off of t-shirts and hats. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so then it became about it became about all right, let me put out music, grow a fan base, and then go to these cities, pack these whatever venues, whatever they are, fifty to to two thousand people. It didn't matter as long as you know half of the people in there left with a Ren Thomas hoodie or a hat. Yeah. And then you know the venues paying me for my time to come out and perform. That's the business. That's all it is. So you ever you ever watch the movie Spaceballs? Yeah. So there's a there's a there's a scene where Mel Brooks he goes merchandising. Right. Do you remember that scene? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like one of the that's like he one of the most gift shop, right. He's got a gift shop. Yeah. So the the reason why he put that scene in there was in order for him to make the movie Spaceballs, he he had to contact Lucas for right. the rights to do that. And okay. not get sued by George Lucas because it was a parody on Star Wars, right? Yeah. So in order for him to do that, he had to give up the right to, the rights to sell merchandise. So if right. you look around on the internet, there's no space spaceballs merchandise for a reason. Really? Yes. So that's why he put the guys. The guys are fucking genius. That's why yeah. he put. That's why he put that that scene in the movie. That's hilarious. It was like it's the merchandising, and that's and that's. That's the differentiator between somebody that makes their art. So you, you, you're, you're an artist, bro. You, you're going you're gonna to be whatever it is that you want to be. But the difference right. between somebody like you, is that you and somebody else is that you understand that in order for you to, to, to do that craft, you got to understand the merchandising aspect of what you do. You got to understand the monetization of your art. Right. Which is, so which is what that. a lot of artists lack nowadays. For sure. A lot of a lot of the young artists that I try to talk to, I'm like, "Yo, where's your merch table? Yeah. Where, where, where are your physical copies of your album?" Yeah, like, hey, nobody listens to CDs. I'm like, "That's cool. People might not even have a CD player, and they might buy one they from buy you it. Because yeah. they want support because they like the music." Absolutely, you're giving something. You're giving them something to an option for them to spend their money to support right. your art. Right. That's dope, bro. Yeah. So, so you leave the show. You're back in limbo. You go on tour. You put a whole tour together. That's yeah. a definition of hustle. Right. You're not, you're not waiting. You're not standing around waiting for somebody to give you a deal. 
nah. you're going out there and you're, you're trying to, you're trying to build on your own. No, nah, cause I knew, I knew what a deal looked like cause I had been signed when I was younger. Yeah. And I knew that in order to make a living out of it, that I could sign with somebody and they can make me look rich or I could live a comfortable life and live off of the fan base that I had already built. Yeah. You, you got know, enough to do it on your own and keep building. Cause like I always tell Cass, I'm like, yo, if you could get a thousand people to spend a thousand dollars on you a year, that's a million dollars. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, you don't need this, you don't need a hundred million followers where you only have 2% of them or probably less than that, like actually buying merchandise or coming to a show. Sure. You know what I mean? Anybody could get a hit record and be on the radio, but it's about like when I throw a show and I can sell out a venue in Ohio and, you know, leave there with a bag of money because of, you know, selling t-shirts and whatever. Yeah. Shot glasses. Like, you know, we did every, did every. Yeah. 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 So, Talk to me about this battle, this rap, battle rap scene right now and where that is for you. Like, so, ba- um, r- real quick, based on my research, right? this battle rap thing is crazy, bro. Yeah. There's like leagues and shit. This yeah. shit is crazy. So, so the, the biggest league, so Grind Time was the biggest league when I was doing it. Yeah. Um, now the biggest league is Smack. Hmm. So I hadn't done a professional battle in seven years. And uh, a guy who I knew who actually like rose up the ranks since back in the day, he became one of the coordinators for smack. And he reached out to me and he said, yo, you want to do a battle on smack? And, and three weeks ago I went and I had battle of the night. Crazy. Yeah. So I guess I'm back (laughs) doing that, but I'm also, I'm, I'm dropping music every week. I I got a new album that I'm working on. I'm I'm like, I'm going to juggle both because not many people can. And I feel like if I can, why not do both? For sure. Don't box there yourself. Was a, there was always a stigma about battle rappers that they couldn't make music. Yeah. But I'm not a battle rapper. I'm an artist who can battle. So why not? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know for what sure. I mean? Where is it written that you can't do both? It's not. It's just been, it, 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 it's more of like, you know, most guys that battled back in the day, when they would make records, they would get in the in the studio and they would do their battle raps over beats. Sure. That's it's not, not really it's do. not the same thing. No. Yeah. No, I understand that. Just 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 watching a battle rap and then looking at an album or you know listening to an album is a completely different thing. Right. It's a completely different thing. It's two, it's two, two different types of art, but right. it does not oh, it does not mean that people cannot do both. Right. It's and it's like it's two sides of the brain too, which people don't understand like so explain, explain that. So I have, I'm, I'm battling. So this is a television show that I'm doing. So caffeine and Drake and URL just teamed up to do this new thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's this app. That I've, they, I've heard of an app caffeine. Yeah. I've heard of it. So, so they stream all the battles through there now. Crazy. Is it getting too dark? It's a little dark. Yeah. 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 But that's I mean, cool. Uh, I can, st- I can still hear you. If you're good, I'm good. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah I'm fine. Um, so, uh, basically they, they, they're doing this television show. Yeah. So, uh, they had the first round of it a few weeks ago. I battled there. I won. So now I'm moving on to the next round. So I'm finishing up my album that I want to release in March. Mm -hmm. And so before I get back into writing for my battle in February, I want to, be able to finish writing music before I go back into battle mode because it's hard to do both at the same time because the way that you structure things for a battle are totally different than the way you would for a song. Hmm. That's the problem with most artists who try to battle or most battlers who try to be artists is they don't understand that there's a difference. What's the difference? What is the difference exactly? rhyme scheme, the cadence, what you're saying, how you're saying it, all of that. Like you don't want to write a, a song to a, to a beat. The beat is supposed to dictate what the rapper is going to say. Right. In my opinion. Right. Yeah. So if the beat is telling me to write a love song, but I'm in battle mode, I'm going to be coming up with triple entendres about how to kill someone. It's not going to work on a love record. Right. 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 It's not the same thing. 
no. So, you know, I want to, I, I, I have like a timeline, like, all right, over the next two weeks, I'll complete the album. And then I could start getting ready for this battle in February. Gotcha. gotcha. Because it's a, it's a lot of preparation for a battle. It's different. You go on stage and you mess up a lyric on stage. The music covers it up. Yeah. You can re-catch yourself on the beat and be able to make it look like it, you didn't mess up. Yeah. With battle rap, is different. If I mess up one syllable, they're going to know and it's going to live on YouTube forever. There has it's to live. be more yeah. It's not edited. It's live. Yeah. There's less room for error. Exactly. Yeah, that's crazy, bro. So if, so if people want to want to listen to your music, they want to support what you're doing, uh, if they, if they want to follow you on Instagram, if they want to buy your merch... If they want to know who Ren Thomas is, where can they do that? Um, I usually tell people to Google Ren Thomas. It's Google the Ren easiest Thomas. way. I mean, if you follow me on everything is Ren Thomas music. Um, for like Instagram, Facebook, all that, all, all that stuff. Twitter. That lighting made uh, a difference, by the way. <laughs> a big difference, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, on, yeah. yeah. Um, my stuff is to just Google my name. Everything comes up. All the download links to all the albums that I have out. All the battles pop up in the, the, the video category. So I got tons of music videos. I got tons of battles. Got tons of, you know, there's content. I, I constantly am constantly putting out content. So they just Google Ren so, Thomas. Google yeah. Ren Thomas if they want to come. Right now. Find Go ahead. Yeah. As far as like merchandise and stuff, right now I'm gearing up to start uh, something new with the new, with the creation of the new album. I want to re, I'm basically doing like a rebrand. No. Um, as far as like logos and all that kind of stuff, like like this is my old logo and I, I love it. Yeah. But it, it was for a different time. Sure, sure. You know, so so now it's time to move to something something different, you know, not nothing better, but just something something that goes more with what what I'm trying to accomplish next. So when me and you were on the phone with each other earlier, you said right. something about you had a studio, you got rid of your studio. Yeah. Just talk on that. Speak on that a little bit more, because I, I felt like that was that was an interesting yeah. thing to talk about. So I um I made a good amount of money on a road, and uh, I also features. Um, say that again. You so, say you made, you made a good amount of money on the road and on features. Yes, yeah, selling features. Oh. So uh, the way that selling a feature is is like somebody contacts me. Yo, think you're dope. Want to get you on a song? I'm mm. like, all right, cool. This is my price. You send me the money, I'll send you the verse. Oh. Right? So most artists probably do like 10 or 15 features a year. Yeah. So in the last two years, I did 450. That's crazy, bro. Yeah. That's crazy. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I work really, really hard. And like, I don't want, um, I, try to, I try to maintain as much humility as possible. But sometimes I got to grab my nuts. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, for sure. There's, 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 there's a lot of guys who complain about a lot of shit. Yeah. And look at me and think like, yo, why is he in this position? It's because he knows this person or he, you know what I mean? It, it all has to do with my work ethic. For sure. Literally the only reason, like, I didn't have to go to team backpack that day, which wouldn't have led the, the, the main thing of my career is I've never burnt a bridge with anybody. Right. I've wanted to tell people to go fuck themselves a million times, but I never did because I never knew, you know, it's easier to walk back across a bridge instead of burning it and then having to swim. Bro, you know I mean? bro that that's a lesson that most people can get through their heads, man. No, because they live out. They live out of pride and ego. That's crazy. It, 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 it makes me insane to think that right. it's just it's crazy to this day. I don't I don't I don't like burning bridges myself. You know what right. I'm saying? If I don't agree with you, we don't agree, but I don't have to burn the bridge down. Every comment in this video is going to be, yo, you need to stop smoking so many cigarettes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it keeps my voice right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, <laughs> right. So, um, you know, um, the features and I forgot where I was going with that. Um, the not, feature, bur not, not burning bridges and the features. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I took a lot of my feature money and I took a lot of the money from, from the road and from the merchandise. And I re I, I I bought my own studio because I needed a space to work out of. Huh. Um, I love everybody involved. I run, run, run. Would have never had anything. Run, do me a favor. Just repeat that one. Not to cut you off. Repeat it one more time. 
you you were kind of, you, your connection was kind of a little unstable for a second there. Just repeat it again. Oh, okay. what you just said no. I was saying, I, was saying I, I I love everybody that was involved in in my studio and everything. Um, but at the end of the day, go if if I in retrospect, I should have never had partners. Yeah. Um, and and I should have never. Um, I think my biggest flaw in life is that I literally give somebody the shirt off my back. Right. If we're cool, I'm going to I'm going to help you as much as possible. And sometimes I don't foresee the way that people take that for granted. And a lot of the stuff that happened with my studio because my studio is now gone. I, I recently moved into a house and I rebuilt the studio in my crib because I don't want to work with anybody anymore. Hmm. And and it, it, it sucks because it's like a jaded feeling. Yeah. Like, yo, like. There's just there's just a lot that goes into everything, but. What, what younger artists and people need to understand is that they need to take everything that they do and become successful with. Like somebody once told me that there, that there should be five stars around your business, right? So if, my, if the center of my star is rapping, then around that should be production, around that should be a recording studio, around that should be um, a merchandise, you know, team or, 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 or mer like, a merchandise studio or whatever you want to call it. You know, there, there should be five things that always trickle back to what the middle is. Diver like, diversify your income flows. Right. Absolutely. So that's what I was trying to do with the studio, but I learned very quick that it's hard to get good people. Like I, I was, I was, I, I, I wanted to find, I couldn't find the right engineer. Yeah. It was one of my, was one of my biggest problems. Yeah. Um, I kept looking for different engineers and people just weren't reliable. Yeah. Now that comes down to it. It's like, yo, I work at this every single day since I'm eight years old and you can't show up for two weeks. You know what I mean? So there's the, the you know, I had a, I, I had a print shop in there. Um, and I, I had a falling out, not, not a personal falling out, but a business falling out. Sure. With the guy who I was trying to put in place to do that. Yeah. The, the thing is, is like people got to want it as much as you do. Yeah. And if they don't, then, you it know, makes it very difficult. transparency is so key. Yeah. Because if somebody doesn't want it as much as you want it. They should tell you. Yeah. And, and that, that, that's the biggest game that I could give to anybody is like, yo, know who you're working with, know what their goals are as well. Bro, I, I think that sometimes they, they don't know what wanting it as bad as they need to want it is. Right. I feel I feel like a lot a lot of times people don't understand the level of time, effort, and work that goes into somebody's craft, somebody's hustle. Right. And they just don't understand that. So the it, it's hard to it's hard to put a number on that. Right. You know, it's hard it's hard to like quantify drive and ambition. Right? Right. You only you only know that just by just by fucking with people and just getting to know them you want right. to say Yo, this guy's about his bag for sure for sure right, right? Exactly. but normally that takes time and once you enter into a relationship with them it starts to uncover a lot of just inadequacies and inconsistencies the work ethic right. is out there whatever the case may be um that's hard man thing, that's not easy the thing the thing nowadays too is everybody's chasing perception likes likes yeah. and follows and perceptions so yeah. you know People, people will come around you when you're doing VH1 signed. Yeah. And they'll come around you when Sway's playing your record weekly. Yeah. They'll come around you when all these things are happening. But then when you, for your own personal understanding, and 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 I, I, I always said I wouldn't compromise my character for cash. Yeah. So when I didn't um, take a lot of the moves that were put in front of me because I thought that they weren't as beneficial as everyone else thought they were. See, a lot of guys wanted to stand next to me while I stood next to a Rick Ross. Sure. So that they could get the look as well. Sure. And it's like, when I decided, no, I don't want to stand next to certain people. Then you see really who is going to rock with you and who's not because bro, people, people only care about the likes and shit, man. And like, sure. That's that's the that's the one thing that I will forever live by is like, bro, I am not here to make music for people to click a heart on my page. That is not sure. what I'm here for. I'm yeah. here to create music because without music, I am nothing. 
right? That's, that's, that's how I felt since that day that I picked up that cassette from my brother's room and listened to it. You know what I mean? It, it changed me, it made me a different human. So music and hip hop, it's what I, it, it, it's not just what I do, it's who I am. So when people only want the look out of it, I almost take it as disrespect. Yeah. Because my whole life is consumed with it. They're just not, they're just not invested the way that you are. That's the right. reality. They're not. Right. And that's okay. Yeah. That's Yo, okay man. not to be. Yo, man, when I reached out to you about the show, I reached out to you because I, I saw something on that show. This, by the way, the show aired how long ago? Just for, just for. Uh, uh, I think it was 2000 and it was like 2000. Babe, when was the TV show on? 2018? 2018. It's 2020. Yeah. And I still hang, uh, ho held on to your contact information. I appreciate because, that. Because I saw something. I said, man, this guy's really, really talented. He's about this. Yeah. Um, I'm so happy I had you on the show, bro. Thank you're, you. You're, I'm really happy to be here. I mean that. And whatever it is that we can do to help you with that branding and yeah. the apparel side of thing, we're happy, we're happy to do that. If it's that guidance, it's fine. It, whatever it is that you need in terms of guidance, right. help, we're happy to do that. I appreciate um, that a lot. Your, your story and your hustle, what it is that you're doing, that, that, is, that personifies the show. That's Thank why you. I made the show. Because I wanted to showcase people's direction and, 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 and the struggles that they take, the passion that they have for their craft. Right. You're, when you're speaking on that, bro, that, that hit a nerve for me. So I'm sure that people listening to this is definitely is going to hit a nerve for them. Right. I want to tell you just, I want to give you one, I want to share one thought with you just sure. about that. In the process of trying to build your team and put your people together, sometimes we try to project our needs and our wants on people. Right. And I think that that's, that's the perspective that I've, I've taken personally in the past. It's, an, it's not the right perspective. Right. So what ends up happening is you start to resent them because they don't live up to what it is that you think that they were. Right. So for me, moving forward, the way that I deal is I just take people for what they are. I try to. I'm not perfect. I make a lot of mistakes with that shit. Right. I, that's just reality. I try to take people for what they are. Right. If, they're, if I need somebody to be a slugger, an engineer, and he's got to work 70 hours a week, right. if I have to tell him that he's got to work 70 hours a week, he's not the guy to do it. Right. If he thinks he's got to work 20 hours a week to be an engineer, he's not the guy to do it. For sure. You know, and it's just... Um, that's hard, bro, because when you're in a position of need, you try to project your wants and your needs on a person that's just not ready to do it in their life. So very, very, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a bitter pill to swallow for me, bro. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, it's definitely like, uh, you know, I want, I want my, my goal in, in, in music is to create a brand and a label and to eat with people who I respect and love. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. to, build, to build those relationships. Yeah. Um, and it sucks when, you know, you try to put people in certain positions and then they fall short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can see it in them, but they maybe can't see it in themselves or their egos get involved or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like, it's, uh, it's wild, man. I've, I've worked with so many different people and I have a lot of respect and love for a lot of those people and other ones, you know, they just drop the ball, but you know, you keep I, hope that, I hope that they get it on their next try. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not slowing down for nothing. No, nah, you're going to keep moving forward. Yeah. 100%. So real, real quick, I'm gonna put you on the spot real quick. Yeah. That Yosemite Sam bar. I yeah. need that. Hit me with that whole Yosemite Sam bar. Listen to this. Listen to this. You got it. Yeah, hold on. Go ahead, go ahead. Take it, take, take it. I got to start from the beginning of it, though. Hold go on. ahead, go ahead. Do whatever it is that you need to do to get to that. Just get to it. That, that's one of the hardest bars I heard in a while. Uh, give me one second. Oh, uh, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to edit this part. <laughs> no, no, look, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna chop this. We had a, oh, okay, we had uh, some pieces that we had to take out, anyways. I got the. Uh, shit, I listened to this today. Isn't that crazy? Um. Give, give me, give me, a, give me another bar, whatever. No, 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 no. Bar. I'm gonna hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to remember because I, 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 I'm trying to. I need the first bar though. I'm trying to remember. Uh, 
you hate that song. And my girl's sitting here. She love, got, uh, she, bro, that bar was dope. It's uh, City on Fire. You are now in tune to the sound of a city on fire. Get live. Um, no, it's uh, shit. I'm about, I'm about to pull it up right now, bro. No, 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 no. Hold on. <laughs> Where's my phone? Oh, choosing the light. Go to City on Fire. Skip, skip to like uh, a minute in. All right, stop. I got you it. Go. You got it. Right, ready? Go ahead. Yo, yo, yo. Rand Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. Rand Thomas, baby. <laughs> go ahead, hit him. Yo, watch me box with the devil in 100 degree weather. Rocking a full leather six months after December. In a sauna with a fever without taking a breath. I'm so cold with all of that. I still ain't breaking a sweat. Patron of death, the ace in the deck. Came to collect, tasting his flesh. Y'all chasing while I'm taking a check. I spark the flame to burn the city. Street urchins is lurking with me. Bourbon is in my kidney. Throw dollars worshiping titties. Chaos consume the avenue. Watch as they throw a jab or two. So precise with this bow, I put an arrow through your snaggle tooth. Used to battle dudes. Now we're more than the soul snatching. Sipping the no fat. In the peep, you need closed captions. Letters I string together cause night terrors forever. You'll never be on this level. Three lemons squeezed in the kettle. Ric Flair chops to the chest. I came to conquer the best. Headshot, headshot for anyone rocking the vest. Rebel killer lyricist, I'm all the above. Approach wrong, I have them. Reattach your jaw to your mug. I'm a reincarnation of what all of you was. For you fell in love with money and got lost in the drugs. I feel like Randy the Ram in a candy sedan. Red beard and two pistols like your Samity Sam. Seasoned veteran. Captain Patches up on my letterman. Thomas pick one, Jefferson, Edison, off my medicine. The loudest will be the deadest one. I'm waiting for the lettuce gum, fuck it, I ain't never done. Bitch on my back, ship straight from the Philippines. I will beat the shit out your whole team like Willis Reed. Ox put a football grip across your trachea. Oil in the pen tastes like Saudi Arabia. Your boy get love in every and any stadium. Mathematics if he try to turn my dome to a stadium, it's rent. Rent Thomas, people. Rent Thomas. Yo, man, so fire. So Thank fire. You. Yo, listen, if you guys are interested in Ren, if you, if you like his music, if you dig this conversation, I need you to subscribe. I need you to hit that like button. Tap that, tap that like button. Make sure you subscribe. You can check out Ren Thomas, all his work, his life's work. This man is an artist. He spent his whole life doing this, signed or unsigned. He's an artist. Um, just Google Ren Thomas on Google search and you can pull him up. This is the Hustle Man Show. Remember, it's always personal. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Hustle Man Show. Make sure you click that subscribe button, tap that bell. For the audio experience to Spotify and SoundCloud, links are below. To follow us on Instagram and Twitter, it's at CapSwagUSA. Remember, business is always personal.